Good afternoon, and thank you for coming today to this important event. My name is Francis Pitterit. I'm a member of Voice of the Faithful New York, and we're proud to be sponsoring this event in collaboration with several other Catholic reform organizations. The American Catholic Council, Call to Action, Catholics for Choice, Catholics in Alliance for the Common Good, Catholics United, Corpus, Dignity USA, Future Church, the National Coalition, Coalition of American Nuns, New Ways Ministry, the Quixote Center, and the Women's Ordination Conference. We're very pleased to have Father Tony Flannery visiting with us today from Ireland as part of the Catholic Tipping Point series. Father Flannery is a founding, as you know, is a founding member of the Association of Catholic Priests in Ireland. We have been living through a period in which what I would term an oppressive, coerced silence has dominated the life of the church. Too many of our fellow Catholics have been afraid to speak freely. Many have been taught to be silent for so long that they must rediscover that they have a voice. Too many of our clergy have been cowed into the same silence. We've all been told that there are certain things we cannot, must not discuss. We have been warned that agreement is a precondition for discussion. Father Flannery has personally experienced the power of this coercion. And thanks be to God, he has found the grace to resist it. So as we listen to his remarks and reflect on our journey as the people of God in the days ahead, let us consider what we can do to emulate the example of Tony Flannery and to echo the Holy Father's challenge. Speak clearly. Thank you. So good afternoon to you. I was a populist preacher all my life. That's what a lot of us redemptorists do. I traveled mostly around Ireland, a bit in other countries, preaching parish missions, retreats, novenas, all that sort of thing. I love the work. I, I love the preaching. And I always felt that preaching the gospel, and as time went on, and as we got in Ireland more materialistic and, uh, you know, were consumed by the whole consumerist culture, I felt that more and more the gospel uh, was a great message to be preaching. But I used to write a bit. Um, I've written a number of books lots of articles, Redemptress, magaz Redemptress in Ireland have a magazine called Reality. I used to contribute to that uh, every month. I used to write a column for it. I never thought that the Vatican would bother with me. I wasn't even particularly the most outspoken priest in Ireland. There were some who were much more outspoken than me. And whenever anybody said, are you worried about the Vatican coming after you, I'd say, not really. I mean, a little island on the outskirts of Europe, and I'm not in a seminary, and I'm not lecturing in a university. They don't even know I exist. What a fool I was. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half years ago, I got a, 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 an urgent message from my superior general in Rome to come instantly. And basically, he told me I was in trouble. So, and he said, if you wish, you can bring somebody with you. And I did, uh, within a few days, get over to Rome. Usually priests in a situation like this bring a canon lawyer or somebody like that with them. I didn't, rightly. <laughs> I actually brought my brother, who's not a, who's not a priest, uh, who's a businessman, but also, for a lot of his life, has been what you'd call a political strategist. You know, uh, planning elections, policies, all that sort of thing. So I brought Frank along with me, and we arrived in, I don't know, Frank, were you ever in the head office there in Rome and that uh, pine table, and uh, Frank and myself, and uh, Enrique Lopez, and the Superior General Michael Braille, the four of us. And he slid two pages across the table to me after the usual greetings and all of that. One page was, there were both A4 pages, with no heading and no signature. One of them was sentences from articles that I had written in reality that the Vatican regarded as heretical. Let me be more specific, 
the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith regarded as heretical. Then the second page was a list of the sanctions and the penalties to be imposed on me. Again, without a heading and without a signature. I, I, I remember feeling, you know, it, it took my breath away, it really did. And uh, I was in something of a state of shock. And I said to Michael Braille, our superior general sense, it wasn't a terribly fair thing to do. I should have seen those documents well before I went into the meeting so that at least I would have my mind in some sort of shape. But what actually happened was my brother, the political strategist, and Michael, the superior general, began to talk about it. And the fascinating thing was that very quickly, coming from their two different worlds, they found a common language. Because you don't get to the top of any institution without being a politician. And that's no reflection on Michael, but he had got to be the superior general of the Redemptress. He knew the language, and he knew how to play the game. So himself and Frank got down to business. We've got a problem here. Can we get a strategy to deal with that? So, okay, make a long story very short. Um, the head of the congregation at the time was William Leveda, your own American. And what they objected to had nothing to do with the issues that the media have reported about me, not at that stage particularly two sentences. One was about the origins of priesthood, and the other one was about the nature of church. Now, is there anybody here that lies in bed at night worrying about whether Jesus ordained the 12 on that holy Thursday night? <laughs> you know, it's not an issue that you use your life, lose your life over. Most theologians would say that priesthood in the Catholic Church developed slowly over maybe 150 years. But like, in the end, doesn't matter that much. But I had written the two articles that they took to quotes from, I had written them in the height of the clerical sexual abuse uh, trauma in Ireland. And I was, like my colleagues in the Redemptors, we were out and about giving our missions on novenas, very much at the cold face, interacting with the people while all of this was going on. And to say the least, it was enormously difficult. And the media were, were, were big into it, as you'd expect. And all sorts of questions were being asked about priesthood. Uh, why has it got to the state that it's in? Why did these things happen? Where is the corruption that's at the root of the system that caused this? And it was in that context and in an article about it that I used the sentence, I believe that the priesthood as we have it now is not as Jesus intended. That's what they said was heresy. And the second one, again, similar enough type of sentence that I don't believe that the church as we have it now was as Jesus intended. Now, of course, there's a whole lot of question, did Jesus intend the church at all? But I hadn't gone into that happily. <laughs> So they were the, uh, th that was the original. And what they looked for from me after a period of silence and reflection and prayer and all the usual things, a statement which would be published proving that I was not heretical. So we felt that like this was something what trying to deal with them. Very hard to deal with a body that doesn't, they never spoke to me, they never communicated directly to me. It was all through the head of the redemptions. Very, very hard to deal with them. But anyway, over the course of the next couple of months, what I did was, uh, with a lot of advice, we got a theologian to write a statement in theological language about these two issues. And he ended up with a statement Basically, it was a statement that you could almost get whatever meaning you wanted out of, depending on what meaning you particularly wanted. It was that type of statement with all sorts of obscure theological language that I didn't understand. But anyway, I signed my name to it, and off it went, and Cardinal William Leveda said, that was a very fine statement. 
and we seemed to be coming to a solution. Except that this was the beginning of the summer, then he retired and was replaced by Cardinal Gerhard Müller, except he wasn't Cardinal then, he's Cardinal now, a different kettle of fish. And within a month or two, I think in September, I got a, a, again through the Redemptress a document from Gerhard Müller saying that my statement was not acceptable and that he needed additions to it. And this is where the real problem came in because it was he that introduced the hot issues. He needed two further sentences in this statement that I was going to publish with my name under it. The first sentence was that I accept that women would never be ordained priests in the Catholic Church. That's something. And the second one, that I accept all the moral teaching of the Catholic Church. Now, most of the moral teaching of the Catholic Church, I don't have any problem with, and I think a lot of it is excellent, but for 30 years, I and most of my contemporaries were on record as saying Humanae Vitae was not a good document and the total ban on artificial contraception was wrong. And secondly, so many of us had objected to some of the language used by Pope Benedict, mostly when he was Joseph Ratzinger, about gay and homosexual relationships and phrases like intrinsic evil and disordered condition, condition that sort of thing. So I was very, Ireland is a small country and it is easy to be known in Ireland and I was very much on record for these positions. So that was the, the sort of end point. So people have complimented me on a conscien conscious decision and I call my book a question of conscience but in actual fact in the end, it was an easy decision because there was no other way for me to go. I couldn't possibly have given that statement and put my name under it and published it. Number one, it would have been a lie. Number two, everybody in Ireland who knew me would say he's just written that to satisfy the Vatican and my credibility wouldn't be very high. But number three and most important of all, how could I look in the mirror? And how could I have any heart in my priestly ministry from there on knowing what I did in order to stay in it? So it was down to that and it was in the end relatively easy to know what I had to do. Um, the final nail on the coffin uh, was this. I'm uh, one of the founders and I was one of the leaders. I now resigned from that of the Association of Catholic Priests in Ireland, about five years in existence, and it expanded enormously. There were three of us really in the beginning of it, Brendan Hoban, Sean McDonough and myself. And we said, if we get about 200 people, we'll do very well, 200 priests. We actually, within a year or a year and a half, we had over a thousand. And we were amazed at the growth of it. And the Irish bishops are different to your bishops here insofar as I understand them. The Irish bishops, by and large, very conservative men, but timid. And almost all of them are terrified of the media. So they do not speak out. So there was really no Catholic voice of any strength, particularly on the liberal side in Ireland, until we got going as the Association of Catholic Priests, and then Sean, Brendan, and myself became the go-to people for the media, and we quickly had a fairly high profile in Ireland. And, uh, and actually, I think that it wasn't anything to do with a couple of trivial little sentences about priesthood or church. What they really got after me, but they would never admit it, was they wanted to put manners on the Association of Catholic Priests. And the significance of that was there have always been bodies of priests in the church councils or, you know, things like that. But they were always under the thumb of the bishops. We set ourselves up as an independent body with an independent voice. And we're not the only ones. Helmut Schuller, who was here last year, in fact, had done, that done it before us in Austria. And there's now a group here in, in America and in other countries. The church, didn't, church authorities didn't quite know how to deal 
with priests speaking independently and not consulting them. And they were very uneasy with us. And I'd say, my interpretation is the Vatican. Why they picked on me rather than Brendan or Sean? Who knows? It might have been just accident. But they said, we'll, we'll nail Flannery, if you can use the Irish phrase, and that will quieten a lot of them. In November, by about October, what I did with, with Mueller, I didn't give him the statement he was looking for. Instead, I gave him my own statement, this time written by myself with the help of a couple of friends, not theologians. It was not written in theological language. It was very obvious and clear what I was saying. He didn't accept it as I knew he wouldn't. He said it was incomplete. <laughs> and uh, uh, then at the beginning of November, the annual general meeting of the Association of Catholic Priests was coming up and I was still in the leadership. And about two weeks before that, any of you who have any contact with religious life will understand this better than the rest. You see, in religious life, we take a vow of obedience. We take three vows. Obedience is one of them. I got a, f a letter from our superior general, Michael Braille. Very formal letter. And what the letter said was, was uh, the whole thing about it was formal, you know, with the uh, official heading and stamp and everything else. Michael was putting me under formal precept of obedience not to attend the annual general meeting of the Association of Catholic Priests and warning me that if I did attend, it would make my position within the Redemptress very insecure. Now, just think about it for the moment. The Association of Catholic Priests in Ireland isn't exactly Al-Qaeda, <laughs> not to mention ISIS. We're a group of old men, all of us, by and large. All of us had spent years in the priesthood and still slogging away, running parishes, doing that sort of thing. And suddenly, here I was. I inquired among my colleagues in the Irish Redemptress, did anybody remember anybody else ever being put under a formal precept of obedience to do anything, none of them could remember it. So at this stage, it became ridiculous. I went to the meeting, but really at that stage, we were finished. Now, to be fair to Michael, he did tell me afterwards that he did that because he was ordered by the CDF to do it, and he certainly would not have done it of his own accord. So, uh, I, in the following January, I went to public, I ha held a press conference uh, speaking about it. Helmut Schuller came over from Austria and spoke at the press conference too, which was great. And then later on in the year, I published the account of the whole thing, and here I am. Let me just highlight a couple of things from that whole experience. The first I want to highlight these couple of things because they are crucial to the whole struggle that's going on in the church at the moment. The first one is this question of the magisterium. Now, the magisterium, as you know, is the word that's used for the teaching authority of the church. Now, the question, who is the magisterium? Or what constitutes the magisterium in the Catholic Church? Uh, the, I'm not going to get too technical. This is actually enormously important, I believe. The crowd I was dealing with in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith had absolutely no doubt what, who and what was the magisterium of the church, the teaching authority. It was them. <laughs> they decided. The rest of us obeyed. I and my generation who grew up in the shadow of the Second Vatican Council, and apologies to younger people here, that was 50 years ago before you were born, Stephen. <laughs> and uh, we had a very different understanding of the magisterium. Yes, the Vatican as was part of the magisterium, certainly, and an important part, but there were others. The conferences of bishops, the Episcopal conferences, the writings and reflections and study of theologians, and what we call the Latin phrase, the census fidelium, the good sense of the believing people. All of these things constituted and made up together the magisterium. 
Now, think of the last couple of weeks in the Senate and think of what Francis was trying to do. And even in his preparation for the Senate, sending out the questionnaire and all that. You see what he was trying to do? He was trying to open up the whole discussion. And why was he trying to do that? Because Francis believes in the Vatican II definition of magisterium, that everybody's voice should be heard. And that it is only when voices are heard, listened to respectfully, and the whole process of discernment takes place, it is only then that we have the authentic magisterium our teaching authority in the church. Shaput, what was the phrase he used? That it was confusing. Of course it is confusing. And Francis knows that well. And the whole point of it is to be confusing. Because when we are to listen, there are multiple opinions and voices of people. Of course all sorts of ideas will be thrown into it. But if we do it correctly, with respect, for each other's voices and opinions, and this is the hard bit. But if we can do it that way, and Francis, from the very beginning, keeps emphasizing that, what happens then is the voice of the Spirit is heard. So that's really crucial. And for the future of the Church, which understanding of magisterium will prevail? I just hope and pray that Francis will live long enough to solidly bed down his understanding. Secondly, the question of authority. How do you exercise authority within the Catholic Church? The card I was dealing with in the CDF, again, had no doubt about it. You tell people what to do, and you don't, as in my case, you don't even talk to them. They had passed judgment on me, they had condemned me, they had decided on the penalties before I even knew it was happening. When I, uh, yeah, I, in religious life, and as you know, I'm a religious for the last 50 years. In religious life, we took the teaching of Vatican II very seriously on this issue. And what it told us was that authority, in order to be authentic, in the Christian understanding, had to be based on uh, people discerning together. Now, if you go back a generation or two in the Redemptors before my time, you had superiors of houses who laid down the law, and the subjects obeyed. All through my life in the Redemptors, if there was a decision to be made in community, we got together, we talked about it, we listened to each other, we reflected, we prayed about it, and the decision was made. You see, the radical different natures of the exercise of authority. Again, it appears to me that Francis, in what he was is trying to do in this Senate process, which is going on for another year, he's trying to establish that idea of authority right across the church. If he could only succeed, it would change the face of the church. Now, and then the third one, uh, from my experience, I, you see, didn't really object to the Vatican saying, look, your views are dodgy or whatever word they'd like. I think they had the authority to say that to me. They should, of course, have said it to me directly and discussed it with me. But I think, you know, in any institution, there has to be somebody who is in a position where they can say, look, maybe you need to rethink the position you have there. Or maybe you need to st study and reflect or talk or whatever. What I deeply objected to, and I've already referred to it, was the process that was adopted by the church in dealing with me. And again, I say, it wasn't just me, it was thousands of others right across the church. I have some friends in the legal world in Dublin, the civil legal world, and I met them and I explained to them what was happening to me in the church. They were the Irish word we would use for it. They were gobsmacked. <laughs> they couldn't believe 
as they said to me, that any self-respecting institution would behave like this, that this was type of thing that was done in the 16th century. And then one of them smiled over at me and he said, you can just thank your lucky stars that they don't have the steak and the fire. <laughs> you see, and, and when, when, when I had reached the end of my road with the Vatican, I had a, cho I had a, a, a simple choice then. In 67, it's highly unlikely that I will ever get back into ministry again in the Catholic Church. Now, certainly I said that, I, I, I was saying that under Pope Benedict, under Francis, who knows? But that was the way I was thinking at the time. I had the choice of either remaining silent for the rest of my life and just getting on with my life in whatever way I could, or else speaking out. And the reason I spoke out was I believed that maybe the best service I could do to the church for the remainder of my life was to bring out as much as I could into the open the processes they're using. And you see, from the very beginning in my dealings with them, they were absolutely insistent on total secrecy. And as somebody said to me, secrecy is the great weapon of the oppressor. And I said, I will blow the secrecy wide open in my case. And that's why I published my book. And that's why I spent the early part of this year going around Ireland giving talks on church reform. And that's why I'm now on this tour. And I was doing an interview the other day down in Washington with a, a lady called Maureen Fielder, who does uh, religious, some of you might know her. And uh, Maureen was asking me about my situation. And then she was putting questions to me along the line of, some people would say about you such and such, how would you respond? And one of the questions was, some people would say about you, you took a vow of obedience 50 years ago, and here you are now, you're disobeying the legitimate authority in the church. How do you answer that? And it's, it's, it, I don't know, did you ever have this experience that sometimes when you're dealing with something in your life and you're grappling with it and you're trying to get your mind around it and wonder where exactly you are in it, and then something happens and suddenly you find yourself saying something and you say, that's it. And that's what happened to me in that interview. The answer I gave Maureen surprised myself. And I said, remember her question was, why are you disobeying the legitimate authority? And I said to her, the key word there is legitimate. I said, any institution that behaves in a way <clears throat> that tramples on the basic human rights of its members has lost all claim to legitimacy. So that's me, and that's where I am. And who knows what the future holds. Um, let me just comment then on a few of the sort of, how am I in time? We redemptress, as you know, Frank, it's very hard to shut us up. Um, very quickly, just a few quick comments then. The whole question of women in the church has become a burning issue. Well, it's a burning issue here in this country and very much also in Ireland. Um, and I've addressed in the last year and a half various women's movements for ordination in Ireland and England. And I've been in contact with them here in America. And it's fascinating. Is the question of the ordination of women a very important question in the Catholic Church? I think it is, but I think too, and, and uh, some of those I spoke to are inclined to say the same thing, that maybe it's not the most important question as regards women in the Catholic Church. I think it is of absolutely crucial importance if the church is to become a credible institution again, that women are involved in decision-making at all levels in the church. And for me, 
that is more important than just putting collars around their necks because I know some women question whether be joining the priesthood as we have it now is that helpful a thing to do. Others would say it is and that if women were there it would be much less of a clerical institution. Whatever your views on that, fine, but it is we just cannot have credibility in the Catholic Church into the future while we exclude women from uh, all positions of decision-making and authority. The, I, I've read up a good bit on the, that whole issue, and it, I think it's very much related to the difficulty the Church has with sexual teaching generally. Because I also think, and this is an enormous question, that Catholic sexual teaching needs to be radically rethought. Misogyny would appear to have been very much part of church life right back to about the 4th and 5th centuries. You could never accuse Jesus of being a misogynist. Quite the opposite. There wasn't a hint of any anti-woman prejudice or attitude in the teaching or in the practice of Jesus. It came in with St. Paul, but it was really reinforced around the time of Don Scotus and Augustine, uh, and it, about halfway through the first millennium. And where they took, as I understand it, where they, they took their uh, uh, underst uh, understanding from was more from the Greek philosophers than from the Gospels, from Plato and Aristotle. And Augustine in particular and some of the others, they understood the human person as being a divided entity made up of two separate parts, a body, a flesh, and a spirit, a soul. And that those two parts were at war with each other. The body was the source and seat of evil, and the soul of the spirit was the source and seat of good. And that the challenge of the humans living through their lives was to see that the spirit prevailed against the weakness and the sinfulness of the body. That teaching, I believe, has had enormous damaging effect on the church's understanding of sexuality and of women right down to today. See, they even went so far as to say, and it's hard to understand the logic in this, but it was a different time, that in some way women are more physical than men, that more bodily. I suppose because of the, the childbirth and all of that. And that as such, women, the, the phrase that was regularly used, that women are the gateway of the devil. And now, link that then, you see, with the notion of celibacy for the priesthood. The priests were the ones who dealt with the holy things. So the less they had to do with G-crowd, the better. It's a dreadful teaching, but it, if you go back through the history of it, it's a great book came out in Ireland just a, a couple of months ago by a, a woman theologian called Mary Malone, uh, The Elephant in the Church, and she gives a marvelous resume of church history in terms of uh, misogyny and the attitude to women. So there's an enormous uh, baggage from our past that is tied up in all of this and that we have to be set free from. Um, the other big problem, of course, which Francis is really working on is the centralization. Francis is trying, and he said it at the very beginning, that he wants to spread out the decision-making in the church. Is that somebody telling me to shut up? <laughs> Francis wants to spread out decision-making in the church. Um, and, and, and the Senate and all the consultation is part of that. No, just that notion of, of how the centralization of authority, which really happened around the 11th and 12th century, 
and developed right through after that, and I think was one of the things that bedeviled the Reformation. Because at the time of the Reformation, the church was at least as much in need of reform as it is today. And a lot of what the reformers said at the beginning badly needed to be listened to. But an institution or an authority system that becomes centralized, one of the things that happens it is it loses the ability to listen. And they weren't able to listen to the reformers. And the tragedy of it is that they didn't sit down with them and discuss it. And then come on three centuries to the 19th century, and we've got the definition of infallibility. Now, and please, Vatican spy, cover your ears. I think that was a tragedy. The worst possible thing you could tell any leader of an institution was that he had access to special powers and special knowledge. Because the more he believed that, the less he even felt the need to listen to anybody. I mean, why should you listen to anybody when God was directly dealing with you? So it, 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 be, it, it added to the whole uh, centralization of the way the church was operating. And it did a second thing. From then on, and that was 1860-something as far as I remember, from then on, every pope had a massive problem, and it was illustrated in Paul VI when he wrote that encyclical on contraception, Humanae Vitae. And as I'm sure you know, the advisory body, by a very large majority, advised him to change the teaching, but in the end he didn't. And those in the know would say that the reason he didn't was that one of his predecessors, Pius XI, in 1932, wrote an encyclical, Casti Canubii, in which he stated clearly the ban on contraception. If Paul VI uh, changed that, then did Pius XI make a mistake? Was he wrong? And if he was wrong, where did that leave the teaching on infallibility? So it has become a massive millstone around the necks of popes and of the whole church. But we are stuck with it. The Vatican Council tried to redefine it, but it, uh, John Paul put paid to that quickly. So there, there we are. Just a last quick word, because everybody is talking about it. Was the Senate so far, and we've only had the first stage, but was it a success or was it a defeat for Pope Francis? Now I'm sure for gay and lesbian people, the change from the first document to the second document and the removal of words like welcome must have been very, very hurtful. Uh, I'd acknowledge that. But allowing for all of that, I think the Senate so far has been an enormous success. Maybe more in the process than in any of the decisions because no decisions have been made yet. I think the process has been wonderful. And uh, if that process can be established and continued right through for the next year. And what I would hope for is that the same process that Francis uh, got going with the importance of everybody speaking their mind without fear or favor and with respect and everybody listening to each other, if that same process could be conducted right around the church, in parishes and in dioceses and in small groups and whatever for the next year, then the Holy Spirit would really be alive and we'd be into a completely new era in the Catholic Church. I believe it's possible and I'm very optimistic. Thank you very much. When I read your story, I thank you for your own courage and response to your own experience of silence and repression and opposition from the church, that some of you found a way to speak with dignity, with courage, and in such an uncompromising, committed manner. Thank you. I want to thank you for that. It's such a model of 
not whether to stay or not, but actually how to stay. And to articulate a voice, and in a way that speaks for so many people who have been silent. So many. And as a gay man, I have to say that perhaps like many others, I stopped somewhere along the line, even looking to bishop or pope or anybody in power for finding a way to live with meaning and with hope. And I found that actually among the people. So the hope for me, I must say, well, the Synod was meeting in Rome and that gathering of bishops talking about whether to say welcome to gay people or not. Wow, imagine saying, um, wow, Catholic Church is about to say welcome to the unwelcome. Wow, imagine if we started really living the gospel and welcoming everybody. Respect. Unbelievable. But I was in a parish in Hartford, Connecticut that has a very strong, vibrant LGBT ministry, Le Le, that was hosting a screening of a film about John McNeil. And therein, for me, lies the hope. People who are taking their own initiative at the grassroots. And even after the filming, two women stood up and said, we've been together 40 years. We got married in Connecticut. And this is our parish too. And so it's saying it's not just the bishop, it's not even the pastors. It's ours. And um, so somewhere it's about, I'm not waiting for a pope or a bishop, but actually it's about unwrapping our gifts, insisting on our place at the table. Just like I would say, I'm grateful to the people here who taught me that all the liberation theology in the world is no good to me. If I can't go back to my own family and find my place at the table and claim it as a human person with dignity. That's the hope, is uh, the people who've shown me how to stay, how to speak up as an adult. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up the formal question and answer period now. On behalf of everyone, let, let's thank Tony Flannery for coming. We'll all be praying for you as you make your way across the country. Um, this is all part of the process that, we are, that we're invested in, and we're so grateful that you've come and, and committed yourself to, to be part of this process with us. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, you. thank you all very much.